turn to Luke 5, verse 1 to 6. Luke 5, verse 1 to 6. I'll be reading from the NLT. I normally read from the New King James, but I like it specifically, um, this text in the NLT. And we've been in a series titled, Hello, My Name Is. Have we enjoyed the series so far? Yeah. <sighs> Pastor Brian, he can preach and sing. It's just not fair. <sighs> God, to God be the glory. It's all right. I'm funnier. <laughs> I laugh at my own jokes. You don't have to laugh. I'll be back at home later on. So, Anyway, um, Luke 5, verse 1 to 6. And it reads, One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats. Let's pause for a second. Oftentimes when we're in the midst of great crowds, we feel as if God can't see us. It's not true. You might feel like union right now, it's a big crowd. It doesn't matter. God is still a very individual God. He still sees you. He knows everything about you. You came in here with a whole bunch of other people. It's okay. You're from a large family. It's okay. He still sees you, and he has something to say to you. Let's continue. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now, go on out there where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Hmm. Verse 5, master, Simon replied. Love is honesty. Master, Simon replied. We worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. Here it is. But if you say so. It's not if you say so. But if you say so. Master, if you say so. Another version says, at your word. If you say so, I'll let the nets down again. Verse 6. And this time. Someone say this time. This time. Mm. Someone say it again. Say it this time. This time. And this time. Their nets were so full of fish that it began to tear. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that this time it's going to be different. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen, amen and amen. Um, have you ever worked hard at something? It's like someone said, absolutely. Maybe it's for your college degree. We're not going to ask how many years it took. It doesn't matter. Don't matter. It doesn't matter how long it took. We still got the degree. Amen? Amen. Maybe you worked hard for a promotion or something. Like, I really want that promotion. So you worked hard until you got it. Maybe you worked hard to pay off debt. Praise God. You got bitten by the Dave Ramsey bug. And so you worked hard. You remember that first time when you actually got disciplined to, um, you know, pay off that first credit card. And now you're on your way of being debt free. Anybody out there? Yes, it was hard. You worked hard. Or maybe it was something a little bit more serious. You worked hard for that girl. Like you saw her. You liked her. You liked her a lot. And she just didn't see you that way. She kept on calling you her brother. And he said, I ain't your brother. I'm your future. <laughs> you, like, you like bars. <laughs> but you worked hard. Like, you were consistent. You even started to, you know, do all this stuff until your beard and your goatee, like, connected. Like, you worked hard <laughs> to show her that, no, we're not friends. We're more than that. Like, you worked hard. And now, I mean, y'all are together, so it worked, didn't it? You worked hard. <laughs> there are so many reasons why people work hard. Some of it is because of our family, because of our kids. Like, I don't want to work hard, but for my kids, like... I need to. Maybe it's just because the cost of living, it's just gone high. Like the cost of eggs, the cost of milk, the cost of raw Indian bundles. <laughs> it's not what it used to cost, I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> Maybe you work hard because you want to achieve a level of mastery. Like you started something, it's like, no, I want to get this down. I want to prove to myself that I can do it. 
some of us, we work hard because it's just all that we know. It's just we were raised in a home where you work hard. My grandfather worked hard. My dad worked hard. And so I work hard. I work so hard, I don't get along with people who don't. Any of you hate lazy people? Don't raise your hand. We love everybody. <laughs> but have you ever worked hard at something, really, really hard at something, and failed? Mm. Maybe you worked hard on that business. Like you went, you just felt God was calling you to it, you know? And you got people involved to help pick out the logo and everything. You launched it out. You were just so excited for this business. Everyone saw you launch it. And everyone also saw when you filed for bankruptcy. Maybe you worked hard in that marriage. Like, y'all were so cute. It, was, it just made sense. You know, and the wedding was beautiful. The recap video, I mean, you broke the gram. It was awesome. You were really actually working hard on the marriage. It was just good. It was almost perfect. You worked really, really hard, and everyone saw and everyone celebrated. You're the cute couple. And then everyone also saw when you deleted him from your feed. And they saw when you stopped wearing your ring. Have you ever worked hard, like really, really hard, and experienced failure? Maybe it's something major in public that other people notice. With some of us, you work hard at something private. Maybe you try keto. <laughs> they said in 21 days you can lose 21 pounds, and you work hard to stay away from the breads and the pastas and the rice, but the way your palate is set up, you just failed. No one else knows, but you know. You know the disappointment, like, dang, I was supposed to be sugar-free, and then here I am with all the candy in my pantry. You, you know what I'm talking about. Or maybe you work hard at something, like maybe it was your self-esteem. You know it's not where God wants it to be, and you worked hard to even start declaring the scriptures and worked hard at just building yourself up in the Lord, but it just seems like everything that's coming your way keeps saying the exact opposite, that you haven't made progress. Have you ever worked hard? As something and just failed at it? Now, I'm not here to remind you of all your failures. Like, well, that's pretty depressing. I'm not here to remind you of your failures. I'm actually here to shout. I'm actually here to shake you. I'm actually here to push you, to let you know it doesn't matter what's happened in the past. It doesn't matter what type of failure that you've experienced. Failure may have dominated all of your past years. It doesn't matter what's taking place, what type of setbacks or mistakes that God still has more. It's never the end of the story. There is an abundance that's rightfully ours. It doesn't matter what's happened before. You could have tried and tried and tried, and it's like, no, I don't want to do anything. No, there's still more that God has for you. Some of us, we just, things happen that didn't go as planned, and we settle there. We stay in that place. And God has so much in store for us, everybody. And you're just like, but last time, I failed. In the opening text, we find Simon Peter, and this is Simon Peter, not necessarily the, uh, he's not the disciple yet. This is just the fisherman. He's washing his nets, fresh from a failure. And it's in this place that Jesus encounters him. I'm sure he had other successful moments, but it's in his place of failure, this place of lots of disappointment. It's in this place that Jesus saw fit to encounter him. You know what that tells me? It doesn't matter what's happening right now. For some of you sitting in the room, it's like, but you have no idea. The Lord knows. It wasn't like he's, oh, I, I didn't know you failed. He's God. He's God. He knows exactly what's happened. But it's that day that he decided to encounter Peter. And he says to Peter, he said, you know what? Go back out. Go back out. You want me to do what? I want you to go back out. Why? Because I said so. I want you to go back out. But we've worked hard, and the Bible is so good, y'all. It is just so good. Every word is so intentional. Not just, hey, I worked last night, and it wasn't a good shift. It wasn't, have you ever <laughs> worked the night shift, anybody? Oh, Lord have mercy. The pay is high, but it's a lot. But it wasn't just that I worked, you know, and I'm tired. No, it's that I worked hard. I worked at this thing. 
Another version says that I toiled at this thing. I worked really, really hard, God, and it didn't come, like nothing happened. I have nothing to show for it. Has that been you? Like you really worked hard on that marriage or you really worked hard in that job. You gave so many of your years and they fired. Like what? It doesn't make sense. Why, God? Why do you want me to go back out now, even at this point? Shouldn't I just settle and stay here for a little bit? Like, no, because the God we serve, he won't let us settle. The God that we serve, he doesn't want us to stay in our disappointment. I love how Brian said this, like the struggle lets us know that we've changed. The struggle to obey God, to live this righteous life, it's not a bad thing. It lets us know something's happened between our spirit and our flesh. That struggle that you feel, rejoice. That means you're changing. That means you're in the process of sanctification. So sometimes, you know, God will say something. He's like, but I, I, anybody or is it just me? Simon, he acknowledged the struggle. He acknowledged the struggle. He said, but God, now you want me to go out into the deep now, not out in the shallow. You want me to go out into the deep now? You want me to drop my nets now? You want me to put another application now? You want me to go out for a godly um, relationship now? You want me to do all of that now? That's what you're telling me to do? But I tried that. And it didn't work out. Peter says this. He said, if you say so. If you say so. If you say so, it doesn't matter what I think. If you say so, it doesn't matter what I feel. If you say so, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. If you say so, then I'll do it. If you say so, then I'll work on my marriage again. If you say so, then I won't give up on that child. If you say so, then I'll start dating again. If you say so, then I'll join a church. If you say so, then I'll start to read my Bible again. I'll engage in this relationship again, even though I prayed for something that didn't happen. If you say so, I will do it. Another version says, at your word. At your word. At your word. Peter understood that it didn't matter what happened in the past. That at God's word, things that are not become things that are. We got to understand the authority that comes with God's word, everyone. When God tells us something, it's not to bring embarrassment into our lives. It's not to make us anxious or anything else. Like, it's not to bring that. It's to actually display his glory. You know what I think happened the night when Peter didn't catch anything? I think the fish, they were on vacation. I think they were swimming in the Red Sea or something like that. I think they were the few that were left. I think they were playing a little bit of dodgeball. They saying getting caught today. I think they were just having a time. I think they weren't ready. I think they weren't. Peter did everything he could, but I think the, just the circumstances were different. But at God's word, the fish, they presented themselves. You need to understand that we need to understand that when God speaks, it doesn't matter what's happened in the past. When God speaks, everything changes. It's at the word of God that the heavens and the earth were created. Y'all, I want us to be an if you say so church. I want us to live a life of just radical obedience to God. Why? Because there's a harvest that's waiting us. There's purpose that's waiting us. There's so much that God has for us. And how do we get there? It's through this if you say so lifestyle. Heeding the voice of God little by little, little by little. And as we do that, we're going to wake up and we're going to find ourselves in such a place of plenty. I want that for me and I want that for you. But obedience, it's the key. So we're going to talk about something that none of us struggles with. We all struggle with obedience. We all struggle with obedience. So you're amongst good company. Tell somebody, say you're amongst good company. Tell someone else, say the struggle is real. real. Overflow, the struggle is real. 
if you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, write this down. <laughs> the first thing is this. Obedience starts with trust. Obedience starts with trust. Um, there's a relationship some of my friends and their nail techs have that I really don't understand. Like, nail techs. And I'm like, why are you still going to them? Like, they're not nice. Like, they cancel appointments. And I was like, no, but they're so good. Is that, one of, is that you? Some of you guys that have trifling nail techs, but you still go to them? <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you have a friend that has a relationship with the... Oh, someone's pointing someone out right there in the jean jacket. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't understand that, but they are so loyal to their nail techs, like to a fault. I don't understand. But something that's even more astonishing to me is the relationship between a man, Overflow, and his barber. A man and his barber. I don't understand it. You don't have a therapist, you have a barber. Like, you don't watch the news, you have a barber. You don't even Google things, you have a barber. Like, you go to your barber for everything. You trust that barber almost with your life. Like, you disclose things to your barber. Like, this relationship, it's just almost sacred. I don't quite understand it. My husband, he'll get a haircut or a shape up or something like that. And I'm like, do you like your cut? Like, he was like, oh, I didn't even look at it. How do you get up the chair and not even look? <laughs> it's like blind trust that some people have with their barber. But here's the thing, it didn't always start that way. Do you remember when you had to move or go to a new neighborhood and it's like, dang, one of the most crushing things was not a school district for your kids, but for your barber. Yes. Am I going to be able to find a good barber? Like, wait, that's the top of your list? And it's like, wait a minute, so you go in, you're a little bit cautious in the beginning. You know, you're checking up everything and like you're, you're, you're very cautious, but after a while, after a while, you just learn to trust them. We can learn to trust. Some of us are just naturally skeptical of everything. We're naturally suspicious of everything, including God. But we can learn to trust him. The Bible says this in Hebrews 5 verse 8. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. This is talking about Jesus. Jesus, our example. He learned obedience. You know, we can learn obedience too, you know. We can learn obedience. The sum of when it comes to just obeying God, heeding the voice of God, it's almost like mystical. Like, I don't know where to start. I don't want to be ratchet. I don't want to be more righteous. I'm not sure where to start, what to do, and all that. You can start right here. God speaks through this right here. Because some of you, you know, talking about Simon Peter uh, obeying God, it's like, of course he did. Jesus was right there in front of him. It's hard to disobey God. When he's right there, hey, go out to the, nah. He, he was right there. And Jesus is right here. He's right here telling us what to think, telling us how to act, telling us what to believe, think, telling us what to go after. He's right here. This is him right here. We have this word and we also have the Holy Spirit, everybody, that speaks to us. And he speaks to us with peace. There's some of us that are super spiritual saints. It's like God said this and God said that and God said this and God said that. And you're so paranoid. Jesus doesn't lead with paranoia. And he doesn't lead with fear. There is a peace that comes when he's talking to you. He doesn't bring condemnation, praise God, but he does bring conviction. But there's a peace that comes with him talking to you. And we also learn to obey God through his people. Some of you have come here on a Sunday. It's like, how did Pastor Brian know? He was in on my conversation. I know that's just God speaking through him. And guess what? It's not just Pastor Brian. God can speak through godly people here in the church too. And let me pause for the cause. That's why it's so important for us to be a part of the team, everyone. To be a part of Dream Team. To be a part of a group. Some of you, hello? Are you there? Some of you. You just come in and you have so many questions, so many things, and God has something to say. God wants to guide you, but yet you won't allow people in. Ow. That's why we have fast track happening. It's just growth track condensed. 
It's happening, and I want you to come. I want you to get involved. You're looking to be better. You're looking to have, you're looking to grow in your obedience, and I want that for you. And God has godly relationships for you. Just do it. It's so funny. There was a song back in the day. Um, y'all aren't going to judge me, right? <laughs> you're not going to judge me. Someone in the white cap, just say yes. I'm not going to judge you. You're going to judge me? <laughs> okay. So there was a song back in the day. And I it used to play, and I loved it. I just absolutely loved it, right? And, and, and I remember it came on a few, some years back, and I just started singing. You know when a song comes on, and you just start singing it, right? And it was like, yeah, I'm like, push it to the left, pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. Push it to the left, pushing it, pushing it, ah, pushing it. Push it to the left. Pushing it, ah, pushing it, ah. And then friend, a friend was like, push it to the what? <laughs> push it to the left, pushing it. It was like, what are you saying? Push it to the left. Push it to the what? No. I didn't know it wasn't lim. <laughs> it's fine. I didn't know. For years and years and years, I've been saying, push it to the left. And I was always curious, why are we pushing it to the left? <laughs> what is happening geographically in the left? I mean, I didn't understand thug music, so I just thought it was one of the music that I didn't understand. But they corrected me. They said, I'm so sorry, it's push it to the limit. And I said, oh. <laughs> Here I was being so loud and so wrong. <laughs> wow. But it's okay, I like getting it wrong. That's how I learn. Some of us, when it comes to obeying the voice of God, we're so paranoid. I don't want to get it wrong. You need to. You're going to. It's okay. As a mom, if my child is trying to understand what I'm trying to say and I'm speaking to them, and they're trying to come to me and stuff like that, I'm speaking to them, but they just don't understand. If they get it wrong, I would be cruel to punish them. I will acknowledge their pursuit of me, pursuit of wanting to understand. You have to know that your good father is the same way as we're trying to lead, live a life of obedience, as we're trying to heed his voice. Even if we get it wrong, it's okay. It's actually when we get it wrong that we actually understand what he's actually saying to us. And I like it. I like it. Have you ever, it's like, oh, that's what, oh, I felt like God was trying to say something. Oh, our mistakes actually tune us to the voice of God. And we also need godly people to say, hey, boo, it's not push it to the left. <laughs> it's push it to the limit. Some of you are loud and wrong in the direction that you're going in. And you have nobody in your life to say, push it to the limit. You're singing with other people that are singing it wrong. Crunk and everything, loud and all, mm-mm. So I'm excited. When the song comes on now, edited version, hello. <laughs> Push it to the limit. I get so happy. Now, this is not a sponsor for the song or anything like that. Praise God. But we can learn to trust God. We can learn obedience. And within that, we can learn you know the most important thing? We can learn to trust his love for us. A lot of us, we don't obey him because we don't know how much he loves us. You don't. You think that he's still this austere master and stuff like that. No, he's a good God. There's this parable about, um, you know, the master that actually gave talents away. He gave three talents, five, two, and one. He said, do something with this. I'm going away. I'm coming back. The one that he gave one talent to when he came back, he's like, wait, what did you do? What did you do with what I told you? What did you do with what I gave you? And the, the person said, you know, master, I knew you to be a hard person. So that's why I disobeyed you. Question for you, what do you know God to be? Because if you know him to be a hard person, if you know him to be forgetful, if you know him to be unreasonable, if you know him to just be mean and ruthless, then you're not going to obey him. Things are going to come to you and say, this is too hard. I just know, but he's not that. He's faithful. He's good. He's a provider. He's gracious. 
He loves you. He loves you. He bankrupted heaven for you and for me. That's who he is. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we obey. In his character, it demands our human obedience. We can be loyal to a barber. Can we be loyal to our Savior? The second thing is this. I, um, the second thing is this. Our obedience may not always make sense. Our obedience may not always make sense. You know, for some of us, our, you know, I was pushing it too much. <laughs> That's what, hello. But our obedience may not always make sense. For some of you, your spiritual gift is arguing. <laughs> That's your spiritual gift. It's not evangelism, it's not helps, it's not any of that stuff. Your spiritual gift is arguing. That's what your spiritual gift is. How do I know? By the way you drive. <laughs> By the way you drive. You argue about everything. You argue with the GPS. They're talking to you and it's just like, no, I'm not going to go there. Like, I know better. Do you know better? We argue. It's like, why are you arguing? You always have to have the last say and stuff like that. But why? Um, I'm a GPS girly. That's who I am. Why? Because I get lost all the time. I really do. And I follow the GPS blindly. Why? It has me sometimes. Have you ever been following the GPS where it has you going through neighborhoods and like private places and parks? It's like, where are we going? I don't know where we're going, but we're going to get there minus the traffic, praise God. So I put the GPS wherever I'm going. But for a lot of us, whether you like the GPS or you don't like the GPS, when you're going to a place that you've never been before, when you're going to a place that's very, very far, when you're going to a place that you value and you want to get there on time, you will put the GPS on. You know there's something greater than the global positioning system, right? That's what GPS stands for. <laughs> global positioning system. And that's the voice of God. There's a place that he's taking us. And where he's taking us, no eyes have seen, no ears have heard, no mind can conceive where God is taking us. The things that he has us to do is something that's never been seen before by our family. It's never been done before by our friends. But it just doesn't even make sense where he's taking us. He has greater in store for us. And how do we get there? It's by heeding his voice. It's by heeding the route that he has for us. The plans and the purpose that he has for us. And guess what? They're good plans. They're to prosper us and not to harm us. They're to give us a hope and a future. God wants to take us there, and the voice of God is what gets us there. Obeying and heeding the voice of God is what gets us there safely. It's what gets us there safely. Safely, everybody. The Bible talks about how the voice of God is just above the waters. How the voice of God, like, it creates. How the voice of God... It, Sometimes obeying the voice of God, it doesn't make sense. Has God ever asked you to do something? And I'm like, this don't make sense. If you think about it, Simon Peter, he's the fisherman. Jesus, he's the carpenter. Why is the carpenter telling the fisherman what to do? You could say, that don't make sense. No, Jesus, the best type of fishing is actually done at nighttime in the deep. During the day, you don't catch fish there. Some of us, when God is telling us, he's like, but God, you don't quite understand what it means to date in the 21st century. <laughs> or God, you're asking me to serve my husband, but you don't quite understand how he's been treating me through these years. God, it don't make sense. Like, it don't make sense. But yet, that's how God leads us. Some of us, we need to put obedience over our opinions, everybody. We have an opinion about everything. God didn't ask you. God didn't ask me. He didn't. He actually says this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, nor, <laughs> says the Lord God, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Ow! That does hurt. Because some of us, they're very smart. 
and we can reason and we can rationalize so well, overflow, and we can. We are smart, but we're not that smart. There's a better way of doing things. And sometimes it's just not going to make sense. It reminds me of the children of Israel when they were about to step into the promised land. You familiar? They're facing their first opponent, Jericho. Jericho, walled city, Jericho. Formidable, like, army, Jericho. Like, they, Jericho was small, but it was actually mighty. They said the wall was so thick that they can actually race chariots on top of it. And so I said, okay, I have this for you. You're going to defeat them. Okay, cool. Tell me the strategy. I'm ready. Assemble a marching band. You want me to do what? I want you to assemble a marching band. On the first day, I want you to go around the city one time. I want you to actually do it for seven days. And on the seventh day, I want you to go around it seven times. And then shout. And then blow your trumpets. You want me to do what? It doesn't make sense. We're actually that... We're at a disadvantage this way. They're going to know what our plan is. They're going to see what it is, and they're going to attack us. We're going to die. Perhaps that's the whole point. Perhaps the things that God has us to do, perhaps it's to kill something within us. Some of our flesh, it's so alive. You know? You know God is asking you to do something. It's like, oh. You almost start to twist. It's like, ugh. I know you want me to apologize, but, mmm. Is there anything else you want me to do? <laughs> I really don't want to be disobedient, but, ah. It's not going to make sense. Will we do it anyway? It reminds me of the story of Naaman. He was the Syrian general that had leprosy. And it's, what's leprosy? For some of you that are not familiar, it is an, um, sorry, this thing is like in my way. It is a severe skin disease, right? And the prophet tells Naaman, hey, I know you have this severe skin disease. I want you to go dip seven times into the Jordan. You want me to do what? <laughs> That's the voice of Naaman. I Googled it. <laughs> you want me to do What? I want you to go dip seven times. Just dip in water. Yes. Do it seven times. Not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, but seven. Seven, the number of completion. Why so many times? Why do the simple thing so many times? There's a muscle of consistency and trust that's being built when we do the simple, the simple things over and over and over again. I want you to apply. Again, Yes. You're not going to die from applying. Do it again. I want you to try for a new relationship. Right now, yes. Oh, God. <laughs> the spirit of the Lord is thick right here. Sometimes God is asking us to do just the simple things over and over again. Some of us were comfortable doing the simple thing once. We'll do it twice. You want me to do it again and again? And again, for some of us, it's not seven times that God is asking us to do. Sometimes it's a little bit longer. And we're just like, when? How long? I don't know. But he's just asking you to do this simple thing over and over and over again. There's something that's built within us. There's a perseverance that's built within us when we obey God's word over and over and over again. Sometimes obeying God is not going to make sense. You are trying to rationalize it like, I don't get it. Me neither. But I honor his word, and I'm going to do it. The last thing is this. Godly obedience brings a harvest. Godly obedience brings a harvest because we're taking notes, right? <clears throat> Am I talking to somebody? Godly obedience brings a harvest. God wants to bless us. Someone says amen. Someone actually say, God wants to bless me. Overflow. God wants to bless me. He does. And God wants to prosper you. And not just one area of your life, but in all areas. He's such a good God. This is our Savior. He's such a good God. We live in a fallen world, and so things happen that we don't understand. But his character is that he wants to bless you. He's already bankrupted heaven. There's nothing that he won't also freely give you as his child. God wants to bless you. God has abundance for you. 
Christ came so that we may have a life and life more abundantly, a life that overflows. God wants to bless you. He does. We need to understand that that's the character of our God. He wants so much more for you than you want for you. That's the God that you and I serve. Our responsibility is to simply obey him. And is obedience hard? Of course. Of course. That's why we have the Holy Spirit that helps us. That's why in seasons where it's really, really hard, we're in groups. <clears throat> Was I talking to somebody? But there is a timing attached to God, to obeying God's word. The Bible says in Luke 5, verse 6, and this time their nets were so full of fish they began to tear. And this time. They've gone, they've already done it in the past, nothing happened. But at this time, it was different. I don't know how many times you've done the right thing. I don't know how many times you've dropped your net. I just want to say when you do it again this time, it's going to be different. Galatians 6 verse 9. I love and I hate this verse. I can throw this towel somewhere. It says, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. Let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right, at just the right, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. This time is talking about God's purpose time. This time is talking about not chronological time. This time is talking about kairos, that God appoints a time. It says to not get tired doing what is good. Not get tired of obeying this thing. Not get tired of being in community. Not get tired of tithing, praise God. Not get tired of putting yourself out in godly relationship. Not get tired of doing what is good because at just the right time, there's going to be a harvest that comes our way. Well, Pastor Zai, how do I know what time it is? How do I know if it's just a regular time or if it's, it's this time? How do I know what? You don't. We don't. And that's why it's called faith. That's why it's called faith. And that's why we're called believers. Because we believe. I want you to just go and do one thing the first time God says, and I want there to be an immediate harvest. That's what I want. That's what I want for me. But what I know is that sometimes it doesn't happen that way. Peter went out at night and he fished. He was doing the right thing. But yet he worked hard all night long and caught nothing. For some of you, you're doing the right thing. You're obeying God, but it just hasn't been the right time. Hear me, don't stop. Hear me, don't stop. This is for someone that wants to give up working on your marriage. Don't stop. This is for someone that wants to give up on that relationship with that parent. Don't stop. This is for someone that wants to give up on trying and applying for a new position. They know God is shifting them. Don't stop. This is for someone that God is speaking to them specifically about going even starting a date again. Don't stop. You don't know when the proper time is. I don't know when the proper time is. That's why we have faith. That's why we have faith. That's why we have faith. I love this scripture. One of my favorites is found in Genesis 8.22. Oh. great muscles. <laughs> it says this, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. Cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. This is God speaking to Noah and also to us, like this lasting covenant. This is after the flood. He's like, this is not just to Noah, but to us. And it's not just a covenant for them, but this is a covenant for us. 
that there will always be seed, there will be time, and then there will be harvest. Think of it, every time you obey, it's seed. Every time you hear the voice of God, it's seed. Every time you do what he's called you to, it's seed. It's seed. And there will be time. And you know, a lot of us, we want, when we obey, we want the harvest right away. But there has to be time right there. There has to be time. And for some of us, we receive all that God has for us a second time. For some of us, it's actually the, the 200th time. It doesn't matter. I don't know. But there's seed. And then there's time. And then there is, and then there is, hey, for some of you, you've planted a lot of seed. And I came here all the way from Maryland to say it's harvest time. I came all the way from Maryland to say you have to get your expectation up. That if you were to dare to believe in God, if you were dare to believe in the principles of God, that you will see what's promised yours. But here's the thing. Is it okay if your harvest doesn't come directly to you but to your children? Is it okay? Is it okay that you have a lifetime of obeying and doing the right thing over and over and over and over again and you don't see the fullness of the harvest but your kids see it? Is that okay? Or your nephew and your nieces, they see it? Is it okay? Will you stop obeying God? Because some of us have. I don't see it. What if it's not all the way for you? What if it's for the people connected to you? That one's hard. Because when you put in work, when you invest, when you actually believe in something, you want to see it. But we have to trust God. You know what's so interesting with Simon Peter? He, um, he trusted God. He said, if you say so, I'll do it. And so he did receive this wonderful harvest. He said that the nets, that it began to break. Say what? He had to get the homies to come and all of that. It was wild. But that's not the miracle. What happened actually is because of obeying, his purpose was actually realized. It was revealed to him. Jesus said, no, no, you've been fishing for fish. No, 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 you're going to be a fisherman of people. For some of us, we're so confused about our purpose. For some of us, we're living life, and we know that there's something more, but we don't even know what it is. Hey, welcome to Union Church. We're uniting people with purpose, and there's a purpose that God has for you and God has for me, and there's something that's going to wake us up in the morning. It's going to be like, wow, God has that for you, and how do we get there? Obeying. And the big things and the little things. God says to call this person, it's a nudge. God says to tithe, to put him first in finances, give him the first 10%. <laughs> 10? <laughs> Did you mean 8? Obey him. God says to read his word. Read it. God says to be in godly community. Be in it. God says to put another needs that's higher than yours. Do it. God says to trust him. Do it. Because when we do it little by little, y'all, there's a harvest that's coming. Bow your heads. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Lord, you know this message has been burning on my heart. And I just thank you for how you came and how you spoke to your precious people. God, I speak courage in the room. There's so many of us, God, we've taken leaps of faith. And it just hasn't gone the way that we wanted. Some of us, we're just heartbroken in this moment more reminded of our failures than we are of you. God, I pray, Father God, for this willpower, this fresh strength, God, to go out so that we can do the right thing to do what you've told us to. I pray for a want-to attitude. I pray for a get-to attitude, that we get to read your word, that we get to be in your presence, that we get to fellowship, God. I pray that we become addicted to your presence, oh God. I thank you, Father God, that harvest is coming, that breakthrough is coming, that this time... Something breaks. This time, breakthrough actually takes place. God, I pray now for a group of people, and you know them. You've been so excited about them coming to church today. And that's those that don't know you. If you're in the room, you know who you are. You might be familiar with church. You might have gone to church. Oh, you might be familiar with the passage. You know all the church isms, but you don't know the God of the church. Or if you know him, you haven't surrendered fully to him. 
hey, we're glad you're here. And more than us, Jesus is glad that you're here. And he wants a relationship with you. You came in here with so much guilt. You came in here with so much shame. You came in here with the pressures of the world on you, and Jesus wants to take it away. He died on the cross so that you can live in abundance. He died on the cross so that you can live forgiven. And if that's you, that just you know that you don't have a relationship with God, overflow here in the room or online, you know. It'll be my pleasure, my absolute delight to pray for you. I'm not going to have you stand up or come up front, but right where you are, if you can just repeat this prayer after me in church. Out of encouragement, can you repeat this prayer after me? Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. God, I ask that you step into my life. God, I surrender everything, every area. You are Lord. And if you say so, I will obey. And God, thank you for what's next. The harvest, it's mine. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. Everybody say